Amen. Now, how many of you have heard of the four horsemen, not of the apocalypse, but the four horsemen of the new atheism? Anybody heard of the four horsemen? Four people, three people. So the new atheism is not incredibly new anymore. Uh, it, was kind, it kind of had its heyday, I think, in the early 2000s, but it was very influential. And it was, it's called the new atheism because it was some really bright and maybe, I don't know, a little arrogant atheist fellows who were basically putting some really serious challenges to Christianity. And uh, the, I think the explosion of the internet age and the emergence of this new atheism really let this movement spread and have lots of influence uh, all across uh, our world. So these, the four horsemen, as they, they called themselves actually, uh, are Sam Harris, does that name sound familiar? Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett, and this fellow that we're going to engage a little bit with today, Christopher Hitchens. So I've got a, a clip of Christopher Hitchens giving what he calls his impossible challenge to the church. So let's go ahead and play uh, that clip. I also have a wager that I put to the religious in these cases. And you may be interested to know that I've tried it with everyone from the guy who founded Bush's faith-based initiative, Mr. Olasky to various Baptist pastors, a Buddhist nun, a rabbi, charismatic Catholic, various pastors on radio and television all up and down the country, no, not yet an answer from them. It's simple. You have to name or cite a moral action performed or a moral statement made by a believer that could not have been made by an atheist. That's all you have to do, and it cannot be done. If you want someone to sort of make you feel like an idiot for being a Christian, these are the guys to listen to. All right, so that's his challenge. He's basically saying, list one moral action that you can do as a Christian that I can't also do as an atheist. That's basically the challenge. And he's challenging Christianity based on this thing that is very popular for Christians to say, you might find that you have said it yourself. And it's basically this. You say, apart from Jesus, I am a horrible, evil person. Apart from Jesus, I am completely wicked. And people will say, the only good in me is him. And people say this out of a, it's, it comes from a good place. It comes from us trying to minimize ourselves and maximize Jesus. We're trying to be humble in that way. We're trying, I think, to do what John the Baptist did when he said, I must decrease that he must increase. And so I think that this is um, a misinformed way of trying to do that, saying, apart from Christ, I am perfectly evil and wicked. Because what we are inadvertently doing when we say that is we're saying all the people who are apart from Christ right now are perfectly evil and wicked. They have no good in them at all. And Christopher Hitchens is saying, okay, prove it. Name one good thing you can do that I cannot also do completely apart from Christ. Now, I have a good friend who left the Christian faith entirely because she traveled the world and she met lots of people who were good. They're loving, altruistic people who didn't know Jesus at all. In fact, she said a lot of these people are more loving than the people back home who say that the only good in me is Christ, who imply that without Christ, people are completely debased and perfectly wicked and will always only ever do evil. And she said, well, that's just not how it works, clearly. Here I've met all these people who are so awesome and altruistic and good, yet they don't know Christ. So she came to the same conclusion that Hitchens has come to, that the Bible is flawed in its understanding of humans. And so she pitched the Bible, just like Christopher Hitchens has done, except Hitchens goes a step further, and he has made it his job to make you also get rid of the Bible. So have you ever heard that argument, the impossible challenge before? Have you ever heard it? It's not that common of an argument, uh, but it is an argument that people made. And are you aware that we here at Wellspring have a small group that is dedicated to apologetics? 
Raise your hand if you're in the apologetics small group. Raise it higher than that, like really, really high. Okay, so there's a few people. You know, we have an apologetics small group. Maybe uh, if, uh, now that I'm giving it a big plug on Sunday, it'll be a bigger small group. Uh, but uh, apologetics has a very important place in the life of Christianity. Uh, my testimony was heavily influenced by apologetics. So there you go. You got your plug. Uh, and it's Unfortunately, today, this Sunday, the, uh, the apologetics group is not meeting because we're all gathering to decorate this place for VBS. But all the other Sundays, the apologetics group will meet. And apologetics is answering challenges like Christopher Hitchens' challenge, answering it in a thoughtful way. So today, we're going to look at an interesting piece of Scripture that's really easy to overlook, Matthew 4. Uh, verses 12 through 17. It's easy to overlook because it comes right after a really important part of the Bible where Jesus is tempted in the wilderness, and it comes right before the Beatitudes, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. So it's easy to blow right over these verses, but in these verses, we're going to see that the Scripture is going to reinforce something about the kingdom of heaven that we've already seen, and we are going to attempt to answer Christopher Hitchens' impossible question face his impossible challenge. And at the very end, I'm going to say a whole bunch of really unpopular stuff. But you're going to have to wait all the way to the end to see what that's going to be. All right. So, so far in Matthew, Jesus has been baptized in the Jordan River. Then he went into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And now we pick up in verse 12. Now, when he, Jesus, heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. Now, we're talking about John the Baptist here. John the Baptist is arrested, and there is a considerable amount of time that has just been passed. We go straight from being in the wilderness to John being arrested. But if you look in the Gospel of John, you'll see that a whole lot of really important stuff happened in that time, like turning uh, uh, water into wine. And John 3.16 happened before uh, John the Baptist was arrested. But John gets arrested, and this is where Matthew decides to go straight to. But why does John get arrested? This is important. Because he's calling people to repent. He's pointing at sin in people's lives and saying, repent of this sin. And if you do that, you will get in trouble, just like John. Why? Because the world approves of whatever approves of it, but the world opposes whatever opposes it. If you give the world a hearty thumbs up, the world will give you hearty little blue thumbs ups and hearts. <laughs> but if you, if you call the world out and call people to repentance, you will be opposed, just like John. So John uh, gets arrested. And when John is arrested, Jesus withdrew to Galilee. Why? There are a few reasons, but one is that Jesus is trying to avoid being arrested himself. Now, Jesus knows that he eventually will be arrested, but it needs to be in the right timing. And it's just not time yet. He has, well, one, he has to call the rest of his disciples. He hasn't called all of them yet. There's tons of stuff he hasn't taught yet. And there's lots of binding up of the enemy that he hasn't done yet. So he retreats to Galilee, which is in the northern part of the kingdom. uh, And that's actually where he's from. So he goes to his hometown of Nazareth. So that's one reason why he withdraws, to avoid arrest. But there are other reasons. Uh, We start here in 13. It says, and leaving Nazareth, so he went into Galilee and likely to Nazareth because that's his hometown. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. So we've heard Galilee, Nazareth, Capernaum, and then these two regions, Zebulun and Naphtali. Um, Nazareth is a city. Capernaum is a city, uh, and then Zebulun and Naphtali are regions in the larger region of Galilee. So we have heard of the town of Nazareth, and we've heard of the town Capernaum, but only because Jesus went there. During this time, these towns were not important towns. They weren't special towns. They weren't towns that people had heard of, except maybe they'd heard of Nazareth because of how backward it was and small and, and puny, maybe. But this is not where you go if you're going to start the world's greatest movement. You don't go to a place like Nazareth. You don't go to a place like Capernaum. 
But why does Jesus go there? Well, this is reinforcing something we've already seen about the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't work like the kingdom of the world. Jesus goes where there isn't a crowd. He goes where there isn't a group of powerful people and influential people because the kingdom of heaven doesn't rely on powerful people, on influential people. It doesn't rely on human power at all. It it relies essentially on God's power alone, and it's for, it's made up of outcasts and nobodies. Amen. I feel like I could be part of that group. So Jesus goes to this overlooked place to start the greatest movement of all time, because that's how the kingdom of heaven works. So he goes to Zebulun and Naphtali. Why? In verse 14 and 16, 14 through 16, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. And then Matthew quotes Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. He says, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. All right, so that is Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. And Matthew is doing something that he's done several times. He says, this happened to fulfill this thing that's already written in Scripture. He's done this several times, and he's showing that it's this territory because Matthew is making sure that people know Jesus' plan from the beginning was to include Gentiles. And that's good news because that's us, most of us, people who are not the original people of God. But Matthew's making sure his Jewish readers are going to know this was the plan from the beginning, to include Gentiles. Galilee is a place in Israel, but there were so many Gentiles there by that point, it became known as Galilee of the Gentiles. That's not uh, a big thumbs-up sort of stamp of approval type of thing to call a place, not uh, in Israel. Galilee of the Gentiles, that's saying this is, a, this is not a good place. This is a place that's been overrun by the bad guys. So if you were here for my first Christmas Eve service that I preached here as the pastor of this church, you heard me tell this story of how God used Isaiah 9, verses 1 and 2, majorly in my life to bring me back to God. So I had been heavily influenced by these new atheists, and I had had a friend who came and he asked me all these tough questions like Hitchens and Dawkins asked, and I didn't have answers for them. And so my faith started to crumble, and I would say that it did crumble. It just fell to the ground, and I stopped believing in God. Now, here I am, pastor of a church. I'm happy to report I do believe in God again. Yes! We'll take the victories where we get them. I do believe in God again. And my coming back to God happened in two phases. The first phase was heavily influenced by apologetics. I needed to know is there a God at all? And I was, I was influenced away from God by these apologetic arguments for atheism. So I started to search apologetic arguments for God just to see, can I be convinced that God is real at all? And I read lots of books, uh, Darwin's Black Box, which uh, takes apart the theory of evolution and show me God, case for the creator. Uh, I was on all these websites, Bible Answer Man. I think that website's still out there. Uh, I think another one's Got Questions. Anyway, there's a lot of resources out there. And so I was doing all of this apologetic work, just trying to figure out, do I believe God is real at all? And then phase one ends with me saying, okay, I think there is a God. But phase two was, okay, who is Jesus? Right? Phase one is, okay, I believe that there is a God. But, but who is he? Jesus, are you really the God that the Bible says that you are? And so if my first phase was largely influenced by apologetics, the second one was supernatural. And it wasn't that God parted the skies and Jesus came down and said, it's me. It, was not, it wasn't quite so big, but it was supernatural because it's hard to draw a line of logic here. I was at my parents' house on uh, Christmas break from college, and I had 
the Bible open. Now, it was not really a part of my daily life to read the Bible, if I can confess that at the time. But I, for whatever reason, turned to Isaiah 9, verses 1 and 2, and I read what we just read, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light, and for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them light has dawned. And in an instant, I think I shut the Bible and sat back and I said, Jesus is the Son of God, and he lived a perfect life. And he died an unjust death on the cross, and he rose on the third day, and he ascended into heaven, and he's seated at the right hand of the Father right now. Why? Why did I suddenly know all of that just reading those verses? I didn't read a commentary on it, and those verses aren't even that easy to even just read as a sentence. They're kind of, kind of stilted and difficult. I think that what happened to me is what those verses say. Those who live in deep darkness, on them a light has shone. That supernatural thing just happened to me as I read it, and I'm happy to say that knowing hasn't gone away. The knowing of who Jesus is hasn't gone away. So we've got apologetics on one hand, and we've got a supernatural encounter with God on the other hand, all working together, stir them together, and you get precious Pastor Dustin. <laughs> so here's what we've seen so far. The kingdom of heaven is for the outcast, the nobody, the loser, the person dwelling in deep darkness, because God is the God who shines light in the darkness. Amen? Amen. Now let's look at this last verse in the passage where Jesus actually starts preaching. Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, John the Baptist says those exact words first. In Matthew 3, verse 2, now Jesus is saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And when Jesus sends out his disciples, he tells them to preach the kingdom and repentance. So what does that mean for us today? Well, it's really simple. We're supposed to preach the kingdom and repentance. So I told you that here at the end, we're going to talk about some unpopular stuff. When you start talking about repentance, you start treading into unpopular territory. So let's go back to Christopher Hitchens' impossible challenge. He says, name a moral action that an atheist is incapable of doing, but that you, a Christian, can do. And he says, it can't be done. And here is my response. Exactly. Yes. Yes, exactly. An atheist, a Muslim, a Hindu, a Satanist, a Christian, we're all capable of moral good. The question is not, are we able to be good? The question is, then why are you not? Then why do you do evil things? We can, Christopher Hitchens is right. You can do moral good. Then why do we choose to not do all the moral good possible? Why do we ever choose not to? An atheist, just like a Christian, is capable of living a moral life. The fact that no one chooses to doesn't somehow mean that God is not real. It just proves that we're all guilty. That's all that Christopher Hitchens' Impossible Challenge proves. It just, it just proves that we're all guilty because even though we have the ability to do moral good, we all make decisions to do evil sometimes. And even above that, we make the decision not to do good at other times. The more ability we have to do good means we're more guilty of all the times when we simply choose not to. So the Bible is correct about the human experience. Isaiah 53, 6, just the first part of the verse says this, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. It doesn't say you're unable to walk in the right way. It says we have all turned away from the right way. And that's why we need the second part of the verse. And the Lord, Yahweh, has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Somebody say amen. That's good news. That's why John the Baptist said, repent, the kingdom of heaven's at hand, because you, like sheep, have gone astray 
you had the chance to do moral good and you didn't do it. The kingdom is here now, so repent. That's why Jesus came saying the same thing. The kingdom is here now, so repent. Turn away from the way that you have decided to go. And that's why when we're told to go preach the kingdom and repentance, it's the same thing. We say the kingdom is here, so turn away from the other path. Repent. The kingdom is here. So that's where we start to cross the line into unpopular teaching because nobody wants to hear you got to repent. But here at this church, we believe that discipleship is teaching people how to obey the commands of Jesus. It's not just teaching people that they need to obey. It's teaching people how to obey. And one of the things that Jesus told us to do is to preach repentance. So how do you preach repentance? If you've been here for any amount of time, you've heard me say we need to preach repentance and we need to be people of repentance ourselves. Now we're going to dig down into how to actually do it. So I've left myself 20 good minutes. Yes. So if you're the note-taking type, we're going to have five different ways to call people to repentance. So get ready. We'll have Bible verses and some examples. So call to repentance, number one. We're going to start easy. We're going into unpopular territory, but we're going to start easy. Call to repentance, number one, an invitation to life and life abundant. It is a call to repentance, but it's an invitation. And who doesn't like an invitation? It's an invitation to life and life abundant. This is in John 10.10. Jesus says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So one of the things Jesus came to bring is abundant life. But make no mistake, this call to repentance is a call to repentance. It's an invitation, and so that's, that seems friendly to us. But you have to, in order to genuinely invite someone to an abundant life, you have to point at the life they're living and say, this one's not abundant enough. This one's not it. This one doesn't work. So turn away. Repent means to change the way that you think, to turn your thinking away from. So to invite someone to an abundant life, you have to say, turn away from this life that's not abundant. Follow Jesus, repent of your sin, turn away from your sin, and have the abundant life. Many of you know Miguel. He's told his story many times here. But uh, many years ago, Miguel uh, was living the gay lifestyle, and he had it cranked up to 11. He was living with a drug dealer, seducing men through powers of seduction and through witchcraft and magic. And he was living in full-on drag, probably not 100% of the time, but he was a drag queen. And so here he is living with this drug dealer. He describes himself as the most unsavable person in the whole world. But this little old lady comes on this quest from Florida to Chicago. She's on a quest to find her daughter, who is, well, she knows where her daughter is physically, but to find her daughter and, and call her out of the life she's living. This little old lady shows up at Miguel's apartment and a fight breaks out in the apartment. Now, this isn't a bunch of homies sitting around arguing with each other. This is a drug dealer apartment fight. This is not safe. And Miguel knows, being from the streets himself, he knows this little old lady is not safe here. So in an attempt to save her life, he pulls her into a a bedroom and shuts the door. And the way he tells the story, she wasted no time. She looked him right in the face, and she said, God has more for you than this. Now, the world would try to tell you that that's mean (laughs) to tell somebody that, that that's unloving. But that spoke to his heart. She said, there's a better life for you than this. Come to it. Come to Jesus and find the life that you're looking for. And that was the moment that he draws the line to in his life where he said, whatever she has, that's what I want. What is it going to take to get it, uh, to get rid of the drag thing? Okay, fine. To stop sleeping with men? Great. I'll do it. Whatever it takes to have what she has, that's what I want. That was a call to repentance, and it was an invitation to life and life abundant. Amen. Amen. That's just one. That's just one way to call someone to repentance. Here's another call to repentance. Call to repentance two, an invitation to freedom. So these first two are invitations. And who doesn't like a good invitation? Invitation to freedom. John 8, 34, Jesus says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave 
to sin. But then 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom. So you've got sin equals slavery, God equals freedom. So an invitation to freedom. Here's something I like to do whenever I'm attempting to share the gospel with somebody. I like to talk about these two kingdoms, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of this world, the kingdom of darkness. And I'll say to people, nobody wants to be in the kingdom of darkness, but we all go into that kingdom when we sin, but you don't just visit casually. You become a slave to the kingdom of darkness. And I'll tell people, that's why even though you want to be loving, you find yourself being selfish. Even though you want to be good to people in all times, you find yourself betraying people. You find yourself not trusting people. You find yourself saying mean things and doing mean things to people. And I'll ask, is that how your life is? And people will routinely say, yes, that is how I live. I want to be good. I want to be loving. The world's talking about love, 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 love. And people want to be loving and want to be good. But you can speak to the part of them that knows that they're not able to. And if the person's being honest, they'll, they'll say, yeah, I, I, I do feel like a slave. I'm not able to do what I want to do. I'm not able to be good in ways that I want to be good. And in fact, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we went to Dallas uh, to the Pride Festival to lovingly call people to repentance. And I was talking to a young woman. And I told her about the kingdom of darkness and how you become a slave to sin. And I asked her, do you feel like a slave to sin? And she said, yes, I do. And so I called her to repentance. And what I said was, the way to be free is to come to Jesus, to confess your sins to him, to turn away from those sins, to stop believing the lie that the world says that this is the way to walk in happiness, to repent of that way of thinking and say, okay, whatever God says, that is the way to happiness. So I said that, and I said, is that what you want? You just said that you're a slave to sin. Do you want freedom? And she said, to be honest, no. She said it just like that. And what do you do? And you can't force somebody to repent. And I'm not, it's not my responsibility to force someone to repent, and it's not yours either. My responsibility is, is to preach the truth in love, which I think that I did. I think that she would probably agree that I preached, you know, she probably wouldn't say that it's truth, but she would say it was preached in love. And she said no to it, to what I presented. But that was a call to repentance, an invitation to freedom. Now, she said no to it. Many others have said yes. But that's call to repentance number two. Call to repentance three. If the first two were invitations, now we're ready to take it up a notch into more intensity, uh, maybe lose a popularity contest. But here it is, a warning of physical death. Everybody loves invitations, but nobody likes warnings. When we showed up uh, at the beach last week, I was on vacation at the beach, there were warning flags, do not swim. Now, we didn't like the warning, but it's better than dying. <laughs> Look at what Ezekiel says. Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 18. This is God speaking to his people. He says, If I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way in order to save his life, that wicked person shall die for his iniquity. Physical death results from sin. And so we must warn people. Now, I've broken this verse into two pieces because the whole verse at once is too much to handle. So we're just looking at just the first part. An invitation, oh, sorry, a warning of physical death is a call to repentance. The path you're on will lead to death. But here's what the rest of the verse says. It says, the wicked person shall die for his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Now, that's losing a popularity contest with the world and with the church. <laughs> a lot of the church, not you guys, though. Because if that's what the word says, that's what it says. He's saying, if I tell you to warn the wicked that their sin will lead to death and you refuse to do it, they will die for their sin and you will be guilty of it. Now, that's hardcore, but it's the Bible. 
And so if you find yourself guilty of this, repent. <laughs> Turn away from that and say, okay, God, I have been afraid to tell people a warning. How do I do this in love? He will forgive. But we've got to, we've got to face it. We've got to admit it. And we've got to ask for forgiveness. But this is another call for repentance, a warning of physical death. Many of you have heard this story already. I was at the mall trying to share the gospel with people, and I ran into a young guy who told me right away at the very beginning, I got shot. And then he pulled up his shirt and he showed me where he was shot, and then all these scars from a surgery. And I told him that the life, well, he told me, the life I'm living is going to kill me. And I said, I think you're right. He said, I think God is telling me I have one more chance to turn my life around or I will die. And so I called him to repentance with the warning of physical death. I said, I think that, you're, I think that God is telling you the truth right now. I think your only hope in this life is to turn away from that life you have been trying to live. It's promising a lot, but it's not delivering, is it? He's like, no, it's not. So repent. Turn away from that and save your actual physical life. Trust in Jesus as your king. That is the way to physical life. And I asked him, do you want to trust, as G- trust Jesus as your king? And he hesitated. Now, I believe what he was doing is biblical. The Bible says to count the cost. He knew, and I asked him, I said, I, I see that you're hesitating. Are you hesitating because there are sins that you know Jesus will ask you to give up and you don't want to give them up? And he said, yes. So we just did some figuring and thinking together. And also we actually had to pray for some demonic, he was being demonically attacked. So we prayed for demonic attack to stop. It stopped. And he goes, okay, you know what? Yes, I want to turn away from that life. I want to give up those sins. Because he's thinking, okay, those sins, you know, I've already run the calculation. Yeah, that's going to kill me. So he tossed away those sins, repented of that. He prayed to give his life to Christ. He had an experience with the Lord. Praise God. And I've gotten to follow up with his mom. He's actually doing well. Praise God. A call to repentance is a warning of physical death. And here is another warning. Another call to repentance is a warning of eternal destruction. Romans 6.23 For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is very, very unpopular. The world is screaming at you that telling someone of eternal punishment is an unloving, mean thing to do. That is exactly what the enemy wants you to believe, so you won't warn people about eternal punishment. Many of you have heard this story. A... uh, a woman from India that I met when I was a teacher at an English school uh, came to church one day. Now, I had met her in 2018, and I tried to share the gospel with her, and she was not interested. But then three years later, out of nowhere, she messaged me when I was was already a part of this church. I wasn't the pastor yet, but I was here. She messaged and said, I need to come visit a Christian church. And so I thought, okay, well, you live in East Dallas, so let me find a place. And she was like, no, I'm coming to your church. So, okay, well, here's where we are. So she showed up, and I was on the prayer team that day, and she came up for prayer ministry. And so Brady and I were going to pray for her. I was getting ready to pray for her because, hey, I already tried to share the gospel with her. She shut me down. Of course, that was three years earlier. But anyway, I was ready to pray for her, but Brady warned her of eternal punishment. He said, do you understand what will happen to you if you die and you've never asked Jesus to forgive you and you've never turned away from your 30 million Hindu gods? Do you understand what will happen? You will be judged according to your sin and you'll be thrown into the lake of fire along with the devil and his angels. And I thought that seems kind of mean. But this is what the Bible says will happen. Now, he didn't deliver it to her in a mean way. And when he asked her um, what she thought about that, she said, fair enough. And then he said, do you want to ask Jesus to be your Lord and to forgive you of your sins? And she said, yes. Now, Brady 
young whippersnapper, was getting ready to celebrate. But I knew that a Hindu person can easily accept Jesus as Lord for forgiveness because, hey, what's one more God in a pantheon of 30 million gods? So I said, wait, what we're saying is you accept Jesus as your only Lord and you reject all your other 30 million gods and you never worship them again. And she said, I haven't worshiped them for a long time anyway. (laughs) So, okay. So she prayed to give her life to Christ. She confessed her sin to the Lord. She renounced all of the gods and she made Jesus her Lord. And now, get this, this is her first time. Actually, I think it was her second time in a Christian church. She didn't know that there's this thing that can happen in churches sometimes where a person falls down. But we prayed for her, and she fell down. She fell down very angelically. And she laid on the ground, and we were praying for her. I mean, that has happened here some, but it's not like the normal thing. And, you know, no one's handing out like a brochure. Welcome to Wellspring. Be sure you fall down if, you know, a holy person prays for you. But she fell down, and she didn't know why. And we forgot to tell her for a week. And then when she got up, when she got up, she began to pray in a language she had never heard before. And nobody told her to do anything. Nobody said, just open your mouth and let the... She just started doing it. And we know that that was the gift of tongues coming upon her. And we also forgot to tell her what that was. We were so excited she had come to Christ. We, se- we took communion together. Uh, and we celebrated. We took some pictures. And then a week later, I was like, oh, hey, you know what? Remember when you fell down? Do you remember what, do you know what that was? And she's like, oh, Dustin, I was hoping you would tell me. I'm like, okay, I'm sorry. But here, this, this amazing thing happened. This amazing thing happened on the tail end of being warned, an extremely intense warning and an intense call to repentance, a warning of eternal punishment. And it spoke to her heart. And she said, yes, that's what I want. Now, Miguel, from the beginning here, He had heard that many, many times, turn or burn, you know? He had heard, uh, you're gay, you're going to hell. You need to repent or you're doomed. That's as true as that may be. That didn't penetrate his heart. It was a different kind of call to repentance. It was a genuine call to repentance, a real one, and it spoke to his heart. Now, I think what we want is we want to boil Christianity down to just one thing so we don't have to remember too much and we don't have to listen to the Lord in a moment. We can just figure it all out, get the one thing that we say, and then say that every time and everybody gets saved. But really, there are many ways to call someone to repentance, and we have to be listening to the Lord to see what is this person's heart crying out for. Do they need an invitation to freedom, an invitation to the abundant life? Do they need the warning of eternal punishment? Do they need the warning of death? And so we listen to the Lord and we call people to repentance. But the fifth one is probably the one that we're going to need to be equipped with the most because of where we live and when we live. What do you do with a Christian who believes that they're following God but you can tell that they're in some sort of deception, a dangerous deception. This is extremely important now because there's so much alternative spirituality that is being pumped into churches and Christians are eating it up readily. And so there's new age practice in churches. Uh, This is very uh, popular now with the LGBTQ agenda telling people, This thing that is condemned in the Bible is perfectly fine, and many Christians say yes. So what do you do with a Christian who can answer the majority of all the Christian answers, but they are espousing some sort of deception? What do you do? Many of you have heard this story as well. Megan Miller and I were at the mall, uh, and we approached a young lady who gave us all the right Christian answers that Jesus is who he said he was, all of the stuff. Oh, she was such a Christian. Except she told us that the way that you're supposed to pray is you pray holding a crystal on a 999 vibration. Now, if you hold the wrong crystal on the wrong vibration, you'll get the wrong God, I guess. You'll be talking to Satan or demons or something. And so we were just like, tell us more. What are you saying? Like, I'd never heard anything like that before. And, I, and in my mind, I'm like, God, what do I do right now? Like, what do I say? 
I think that feeling is really common to us in this day and age. We think we've got so many people who know so much about the Bible, but, they're, but they've got this one thing that seems like it's definitely deception. What do I do? What do I say? So I asked her a few questions just to confirm that she really did know all the right stuff about Jesus. She knew it all. And so I said, okay, I believe you are a Christian sister. And so as your Christian brother, I have to warn you that this crystal thing that you're getting into is sin. It will lead you astray. I believe it is a deception that was cooked up by your enemy in order to lead you astray. And I called her to repentance. And she actually received that. I mean, it took a little bit of uh, working through, but in the end, she said, maybe this is a sign that what I'm doing is satanic. And Megan and I were like, I think so. It was a warning to a Christian. So this is called to Repentance 5, a warning against drifting away. And we get that from Hebrews 2, 1. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we, what? Drift away from it. And then Ephesians 4, 1. Paul writes this, I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. It's possible to walk in a manner that is unworthy of the calling to which you've been called. And it's really common and really popular and really prevalent in the church for Christians to feel like another Christian's walk with God is none of my business. You have the authority as a Christian. If you're engaged with somebody who says, I'm a Christian, I submit to the Bible, then you have the authority or the right to say, then live according to the scripture. Let me call you to repentance so that you don't drift away. And that means that if you say that you submit your life to the Bible, a Christian might come to you and say, hey, I believe this thing that you may be doing is sin designed to make you drift away. Now, you want to talk about being unpopular. It, uh, maybe it's an American thing. I don't know. We're all about freedom and independence and liberty, and we don't want anybody to tell us what to do. And that has crept into the church at such a, such a deep level that Christians are saying, don't tell me that what I'm doing is sinful. Nobody can judge me but God, right? We're supposed to call each other to repentance, any place that we see it. That's why it's so dangerous to attend a church but not be a part of a church, because then you're making it way harder for somebody to lovingly call you to repentance. It's already hard enough. Don't make it harder. And it makes it harder or impossible for you to call someone to repentance if you're attending a church, but you're not a part of the body of Christ, the, the body of the church. I mean, you're a member of the body of Christ if you believe in it, but how can you function as a member if you're not connected to the body? So you've heard those five calls to repentance, invitations and warnings. We're going to end just like we always do uh, with an altar call. So we're going to have the prayer team come up, the ELT and the elders come up. But remember, the end of the service is different today. We're not going to have any time after the close of the service for uh, ministry at the front. So if you're here and you need ministry, it's got to be done now during the altar call. All right, everybody good? <laughs> so if you've been convicted of anything that you know you need to repent of, don't waste any time confessing and repenting. Don't waste any time. You don't have to come forward and confess to someone up here, but don't waste any time. Turn to somebody beside you and confess and say, I need to confess and repent. Please pray for me to be forgiven. Don't waste any time. And if you have been struggling with doubt, I mentioned how I had been heavily influenced by the new atheism movement and I had gone away from God. If you are in a spot like that, if you are struggling with doubt, then come forward and be prayed for. But here's a caution. It's, it's not common for doubts to be zapped away in a moment of power. It can happen, but don't count on that. 
Instead, if you come forward because you're struggling with doubt, let the coming forward be you testifying in front of everybody, I am committing to joining with the body to wrestle through these doubts together. Wrestling through doubts is far more of a process than it is of getting zapped. But if you get zapped, great. Embrace it, but don't count on it. So come forward if you need to repent. Come forward if you're struggling with doubt. And come forward if you heard these calls to repentance and you know you are supposed to be calling people to repentance, but you feel timid and you're like, you know what? I want more boldness. I want more courage to call people to repentance in love. If that's you, then come forward and we will lay hands and we'll pray for you the way the disciples prayed in Acts chapter 4 when they said, Father, look on their threats and grant to your servants to continue to preach your word with boldness. We'll pray for you for boldness. And they also prayed, Father, stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders as we preach. That's what we'll pray for you, that you will leave here emboldened to preach the gospel in love, even if it makes you unpopular. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. And God, we don't want uh, to be popular in the world's eyes for the sake of worldly popularity. God, we want uh, to please you. We want to be loving. We want to be your saints preaching the truth in love. God, you know who is in this room struggling with doubt. God, you know the lies that the enemy has sown in. Lord, you know the lies of identity that the enemy has sown in, telling people that they are something other than you've created them to be. You know the lies that the enemy has sown to make them doubt and question your word and the scriptures and and the church. Lord, if there is any demonic force in this room that's encouraging lies and deception, Lord, I pray that you will break those chains even right now in Jesus' name. God, we want to wrestle with doubt well before you. And, uh, and not feel shame about doubt, but feel encouragement that you love the doubter, <laughs> you love uh, the exile, you love uh, the broken and the lowly. God, would you stir our hearts with desperation for you? In Jesus' name, amen.